Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last session for today, hopefully appropriately titled to sum up everything we've learned, revisions and quality control. I don't know about you, but I am still really pumped about all these great discussions we've had today. Writing is my joy and being a part of this uh, section of, of, of the conference has certainly been the most exciting part for me this weekend so far. I hope you're having as much fun. Please feel free to leave your comments and questions in the chat. We will get to them a little later in the session. For those who don't know, I'm Jack Ward from the Sonic Society, Electric Vicuna Productions, and most recently, the Mutual Audio Network. Welcome to MADCON 2021, our final session for Friday night. And our esteemed guests in the session with me are, well, we, we had J.B. Torrance, but beside, he's not here yet, and that's on my list, of course, but we have right, right here on top in front of me, um, we have a longtime audio drama fan and one of the best analysts we have in the medium, in my humble opinion, writer, producer of the incredible series, Wordtastic Kid Agents, also heard on the Mutual Audio Network Saturday Story Circle, I might add, and sometimes writer producer of shows for the 11th hour production series, the awesome Steven Schneider. Hey, Steve, how are you tonight? Thank you. Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, glad, glad to be back. Good, good. Uh, session. <laughs> Absolutely. And last, but no means least as usual, one of the great pioneers of the golden age of modern audio drama who for decades has entertained people of all ages with original scripts and new adaptations of classic tales from the once Chatterbox Audio Theater and the now newly christened and fabulously serious, seriously, you need to subscribe, Spoken Signal podcast, writer, producer, director, actor, every threat known to stage, and man, Robert Arnold. How are you, Robert? <laughs> Jack, I'm great. I'm going to play that every morning when I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is your new ringtone. <laughs> so, uh I, I, I really thrilled to have you guys here to help close out the night. As um, the title suggests, we're all about the revision process. As Roald Dahl once said, by the time I'm nearing the end of a story, the first part will have been reread and altered and corrected at least 150 times. I am suspicious of both faculty and speed. Good writing is essentially rewriting. Any thoughts on that particular uh, quote? Let's start off with Steve. Um, we touched on this a little bit in the earlier session, but whoever, whoever wasn't there, <clears throat> um, it, it's, it's an evolving process that uh, writing a story um, is kind of like, I, I think of it like building an invisible cathedral, except you have to create all of the raw materials to build with first, which are the discrete ideas. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller you have to figure out how to fit them together or if they fit or maybe they don't fit and they go into a different project. But it's, it's just, I, I really enjoy the challenge of the, the endless tinkering with the, um, with the ideas to try to put them together in a dramatically satisfying way that's impactful for the audience. Um, there's just, there's nothing like it. There's not, <laughs> some people do woodworking, some people do carpentry, constructing stories with, uh, with words and ideas is something that's more satisfying to me than anything, especially when you pull it off in a way that, that works, which is not always, but when yeah. it works, it's great. Very cool. Bob, one of my first radio dramas I wrote was uh, for the Deadly Sins series that I did called Pride uh, and Lo Though I Walk. I gave the script to my mother, who's a great editor, and she she said, this is amazing. It gets cut. And she cut like half of one scene or a full scene of a conversation between the main character and the, and the devil. And um, the term murder your darlings comes up and this was exactly what needed to be done. Have you had to go through that same experience? Because it's devastating uh, the first time. You understand it, but it's devastating. That's, that's <laughs> especially rough coming from your mom, you know. <laughs> She's supposed to love everything you do. Oh, um, not but, my mom. <laughs> but how, how, how generous and how thoughtful of her to actually give you some feedback. So let me ask you this, Jack, was she right? Absolutely, 100%. And that's the thing, go. right? Like my mother is known as the great evener. 
uh it, it to me at least so if you're down she will pick you up if you're too high she'll knock you down a little bit she wants to make sure that you got both feet flat on the ground and i love her for it she's a phenomenal woman and like i said a great editor it was one of her things that she should have done and and it helped so editing and cutting back um is 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 really important what's the process like for you through chatterbox and now for now in spoken and signal yeah yeah i i think that quote is fantastic um rewriting really is everything you know steve said it's like a, a blueprint for building a, a cathedral it's to me it's like the sketch that you make as you're making the oil painting that first draft right you're going to do a you're going to you might even do a pencil sketch on a napkin before you blow it up into something larger before you even get the paints out and I think for someone like me, I was talking earlier about how my process is so uh, piecemeal in a way that I, I feel like I can work on this part and then that gets finished and then there's kind of a blank here with some brackets about what needs to happen and something over here. And when I assemble things like that, you know, you can't just immediately step back and it flows straight through top to bottom, right? So there's so much smoothing out. There's so much blending that needs to happen to make all of that stuff work together. So I love that that quote. What I'm suspicious of, what did he say? Facility and uh, <laughs> efficiency. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Writing should be work, right? If it comes to facility and speed, yes. Speed, yeah, okay. I, yeah. I, I got it, efficiency in my head too, yeah. <laughs> if it comes too easy, then it's probably not done. You know, you're probably not working hard enough at it. Yes, well put. And, 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 that that speaks almost double for endings if the ending comes too easily then most people have thought of that ending as well and maybe you should go back and tool it a little more steve uh stephen king's very famous from his on writing book of saying his second draft is uh minus 10 percent do you have a percentage in mind i know neil jones said earlier on it's minus 20 percent for his draft do you have a a cut that you think of when you when you come to your editing I don't have a specific cut, but the way I operate is by the time I get to the scripting, I've already fought through every scene so many times that <clears throat> I've already cut out a lot of the material that would have otherwise gone in there. So in a way, I use the outlining process as a series of drafts, a little bit different than what like a traditional pantser would do. So I do less complete drafts of the script just because I've already done all the thinking by the time by the time I get to the script, but certainly I, I, there's no way of getting around the fact that whether you're a cancer or a plotter, to do it right, you should be thinking through every scene, every episode, every character, every element in there should be a conscious decision. Nothing should happen by accident or without your awareness. That's my perspective anyway. And if it is, then I would question why is it in there because <laughs> sometimes you find that oh i just finished this scene and you know what i don't actually need this scene so i have to take these 10 pages out because it didn't really move the story forward it's frustrating when that happens but it's better to realize it late than never nice i know that uh, j michael straczynski says that a scene must do one of two things move the plot forward or develop a character do you think that's a fair assessment to make, Bob? I think it it better do at least one of those two things. Yeah. And I think, Jack, when I'm really kind of at my at my best, when I am uh, you know, just brutally cutting things down, I think I even just focus on that plot and then you you bake the character into that. Does that make sense? So absolutely, it's, it's weird for me. Like I'll I'll go back and read a draft sometime and think, wow, everything just stops so that we can sit and get to know somebody better. And that's not. I don't think that's always great writing because the plot grinds to an absolute halt, and it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, let's have coffee with this character so that we will then care about what happens to them. And so, so I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, for me, yes, I agree with that. But I'm I even lean harder toward that first part. Um, this, every scene should move the plot forward and you need to find clever ways to build the character as they're in the plot, right? We've all heard stories that don't start for an hour because we're world building or character building and it just takes 
so long, you have to be interested in that as an end. Um, whereas I think for me, the stuff that really works for me, the really skill writing does that stuff almost invisibly because you get caught up in the plot and you start to realize this is how these characters react to the plot and react to what's going on. And that's how you learn about them rather than getting a character sheet at the beginning that says, here are all their traits, now watch them do this. That brings up a really interesting thought that I think is, is sort of tangential to that. And I want either one of you to jump in and maybe both to talk about this, because even though it's not necessarily in the revisions, it could be because maybe as, as Bob was bringing out, it sometimes takes a long time to do some world building. And what we found in modern audio, modern storytelling is getting to the meat of something and then flipping back in time to so like moving forward in the first scene and then getting to see where you got back there so starting with the action is non-linear storytelling sort of a bit of a must in modern day audio drama uh, that we might not have seen in the same level where you can flip back and forth just to get that attention of the audience so that you can go back is that a part of what we do when we try to edit it have you thought of doing something like that I, yeah, um, that's, uh, it's an important consideration because I've, and I've done this wrongly as well, where, uh, particularly in a genre like fantasy, you just get caught up in world building or even science fiction, uh, to a certain extent in the show that I'm writing now, there's a certain amount of like global events that are happening in the background that expositionally it is important for the audience to understand generally what is happening otherwise the foreground uh, dramatics of the plot don't really have a context in which they're situated however if you handle it poorly that can turn into just exposition dumps which are boring as hell uh, to listen to and trying to negotiate how to feed in relevant aspects of the overall world, whatever ha world the story happens to be sit situated in, but at the same time, uh, follow the, um, the immediate <clears throat> plight of a particular character or group of characters going after a goal. That's part of the craft. That's the whole, the, the, that's the skill component of writing right there. That's something I don't think you can just do. I don't care how talented you are. That's something that takes work and it takes practice and it takes making mistakes and analyzing why something didn't work well and figuring out how to make it better. And uh, it's just, it just never ends. It's a, it's a constant, it's a constant revising of, of your, your craft and um, working it out as, as best you can. But I mean, that's, that's part of what I like about it. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a skill, very much the same as sculpting or, or any other art form, really. Well put, well put. Bob, have you worked with changing things up to do some nonlinear storytelling as a form of revising to get to a better part of your story? Lost my air, air there. <laughs> I have, I have. And I, I like that technique, Jack, and there, but there's, there's something about, there's something dangerous there that maybe this this group or the, the listeners can help us define because I do like the like, we start with a bang and then it's like, you know, six months ago and then you kind of work back up to it. But I've also seen that done where it feels cheap to me. And I'm not sure I could, I could right now define the difference. Um, you know, I feel like I see this in film more where you think, whoa, what a, what a beginning, what an opening, bam. And then it's just like, okay, let me go tell you every last thing that led up to this. And then it takes you the entire movie to get back to the exciting part and then it's over, right? <laughs> so there, it's, there's no, Steve's right, there, that's the craft. There's no magic formula um, for doing that. And I, but I do think um, starting with a bang is, is always a good idea. And in fact, I, I would love to hear from you and you guys and everyone listening, like, how long do you give an audio drama? How long do you listen and give it a shot before you tune out? Steve can answer that one. One minute. You got a minute. If you're not catching so Steve, you better start. You better start with something good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not very fair because I know that unfortunately 
especially with people writing new shows or whatever, they don't really get their sea legs until the end of the first season or the second season. Oh, it gets so much better in season three, but the first episode sucks. I'm not going to be around for season three. I'm sorry. It's all, it's, it's not fair really. In a way, it would be better to go back and rewrite and reproduce the earlier episodes just to get them up to the same standard as the later ones, because unfortunately, we kind of figure out what we're doing as we're doing it. So it took me to the end of the first season to kind of realize what show I was even writing. <laughs> unfortunately, that information isn't all front loaded before you even begin. And you kind of figure that out in the process of doing it. Right. Right. No, that's that's fascinating. So <coughs> when we talk about revising and editing, I know the first person is us, the writers themselves. How many drafts do you go through or do you do you have a particular number in mind before you send it to someone else? And who is your next person up the line that reads your draft? So for me, um, that's that's a really interesting question, Jack. And I think that may be personal to different, you know, different writers. Um, I don't I don't tend to have like numbered drafts because again, my process I feel like is so piecemeal. It's more like that oil painting I was talking about before. It's more like, okay, I've sketched here, I've actually started to paint here, and then it all, you know, eventually comes together. And I'm just re-reading and rereading and rereading until and and working at different parts of the painting until there's nothing left to work on. So I tend not to have sort of discrete drafts. I tend to start with a mess and just work it and work it until it's, you know, presentable. Um, I, this, again, this is personal to me, I think. I don't like to turn over a draft until I, I can't do anything else with it. Um, <clears throat> and I think some of that, maybe some of that's a control thing, but some of that comes from um, being in, uh, you know, I can remember being in workshops uh, in school and stuff where, you know, you get somebody else's story or something and you read it and you spend time thinking about it, you make notes and then you get into the workshop and they go, I, I didn't have time to do this right. It sucks. I, I don't like it. And you think, well, I just spent all my time like giving you thoughtful critique. You could at least give me your best work, right? So if I've got stuff I know I need to do, why should I make someone else tell me that I need to do that, right? And I'm not going to learn anything if they're if they're just telling me things I already know. And I think that can be an ego thing. That can be a you know, I, I know it sucks. I know you know I'm not going to put myself out there. It's not it's not up to my standards yet. But I think you got to get over that and get it to your stand. Or again, this is how I like to work. Get it to your standards, and then someone else can see the problems with it someone else can tell you you know is that emotional resonance coming through because the whole thing is built again that's how i like to work um my first reader is always my partner karen who we go see movies plays together we talk about them afterward um you know we dissect stuff together it's just fun for us so you know i trust her judgment she's not a writer herself but she just she does this kind of stuff with me um, and she's very, very insightful. Um, and so if she's read something, you know, she's, she didn't let me off the hook. She's pretty, she's nice about it, but she's honest with me. This worked for me. This didn't, I don't understand this. This is not clear. Um, you know, and I, once I have my, once I feel like I've got my draft finished and I get her feedback and work it in there, then I sort of go out and say, okay, I've got three or four or five other readers who I trust, who I'd really like to see this. But I mean, it's, this is pretty honed by this point, right? Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's just me. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, Steve, who do you have? Unfortunately, I don't have a great uh, beta reader. I wish I did. It can be invaluable as far as improving your project. Um, <clears throat> usually the first time I get to a, a finished draft, which Again, like Bob said, I kind of work similarly where I don't I don't think of drafts as like successive sheets of paint where they take on a more and more gloss every time you go over it again. It's more of like an old Polaroid picture and it's first just blank white and it gradually comes into focus. That's more how I think of 
the whole process of revising, but essentially the, it's the same. It's uh, <clears throat> constantly thinking about it in different ways and, and negotiating the ideas and eventually the script to make sure that you're, um, you're depicting the story uh, to the best of your ability. But uh, you also have the great disadvantage when you're writing something of being very close to it. And it's very easy to make an assumption that, oh, well, the audience is going to know what's happening or where we are because you already know the details. But having a, 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 at least a beta reader who can read the, an earlier version or an earlier draft of the script do, who doesn't know the story you know, how much of that is translated through the script? How much of that comes across to them? And it could be something simple, like failed to introduce a character in a scene. You just kind of assume that the audience would recognize the actor's voice, but that may not be the case. You may want to have to mention the, the character's name. It's just a small adjustment, but it could be a source of confusion potentially if, um, if the listener wasn't really <laughs> aware of who that character was for instance there's any number of things that you just can't you can't hear through somebody else's ears so uh having somebody who doesn't know what your story is and is just reading uh an early version where you can still make adjustments is a very valuable thing particularly somebody who knows a bit about the craft whether it's writing in general or audio drama in particular so. That's excellent. I, I consider it in some ways very similar to sort of the stewardship of a forest, right? You know, the more I can clean out all the dead stuff around, the nicer that forest looks, but I can also see the path so much easier. And I'm thinking of my listeners, right? So the idea is to make things as clear as possible for, so they don't get lost within the story or lost within the sound and, and they can enjoy what's going on in, in, in the entire experience. And I think that that's my, other than that part, which is totally on me, when we talk about beta readers, my biggest frustration for me is the amount of people that I send my stories to that go, oh, that's awesome, or I love it, or something like that. I don't care. I mean, I mean, I, I'm glad you like it. I'm, I'm, it's wonderful that you like it, but that doesn't help me in any way, shape, or form. But we <laughs> seem to have sort of like, People who are, and there's, there are certainly writers that are out there that want to be seen as I'm wonderful. And if, and if you tell me anything, I'm going to be crushed and I will never, you know, write again. Whereas I, I would much rather improve. I would much rather you tell me, honestly, this isn't working and why. And I have a pretty keen sense as to what somebody's critique is, whether it's based upon their style or their taste. You know, if somebody sits there and says, yeah, the, the story is really great and moves really well, but I don't, I think you should get rid of the zombies. It's a zombie story, right? You know what I mean? Like, so you don't like zombie stories. Got it. You know, but that's, that's not, uh, you know, it could be an extremely excellent zombie story. You're never going to like it no matter what. So do you guys have problems with that, with, with handing them off to people who tell you that you're awesome, that you're great, that you're this the, the most wonderful writer ever, and they don't give you any kind of practical criticism? I wish. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Steve. Uh, well, there's two different things there. I mean, uh, one is just a reaction or feedback. And that's kind of, oh, okay, yeah, great, great show, loved it, you know, 10 thumbs up or whatever. And that's fine. Uh, and you're right, Jack, that a lot of people when they're looking for feedback, they're just looking for attaboys, you know? Oh, you're awesome. This is so wonderful, et cetera. Which, I mean, not to knock it. I mean, writing and creating is, is very difficult. And, you know, you need to get some kind of validation of what you're doing somehow, some way, even if it's just a little bit of praise, um, which gives just gives you that more much more incentive to keep going because it could just be very difficult just constantly putting out and putting out and putting out and getting nothing back. Uh, at the same time, a, a critique, which is more along the lines of what you were talking about, Jack, is something entirely different. And I've done detailed critiques for several people. And it's, it's to do a really thoughtful critique is work. It's almost as much work as writing itself, but it can be incredibly instructive for the person critiquing 
as well as the person receiving the critique if they receive it um, with the right spirit. But I mean, first of all, it has to be somebody who has an understanding of the crafts, I, I would think. And secondly, a person who has an understanding of what you're going for. So it, it shouldn't be just, well, I hate zombies and Jack made a zombie story. So whatever. I, I would have to, if I was to review, do a critique of say something you wrote, Jack, I would have to read through it with the mind of, all right, well, what was Jack trying to do here? And to what degree did he succeed in what he was trying to do? Not what I like, but what he was trying to do. And that, um, I think it could be very helpful for a creator. Uh, I don't really buy into the, well, you have to say three good things in order to say three bad things. I, I, I'm not shy about sharing my opinions about what I thought worked and what I thought didn't work. But the caveat there is if you can clearly explain why something didn't work, not just that it sucked, but <laughs> why it didn't work, that becomes a much less personal thing. And it's more about the application of the craft and not about the person who, who, who was writing it. It's not a, a personal attack. Right, right. And so you're talking about the compliment sandwich, right? You know, <laughs> something <laughs> right, that yeah. compliment yeah. the whole bit. Uh, so Bob, once we've gotten through your beta readers and stuff like that, have you gotten to a point where you bring it in front of the actors and they go, I got a problem. What's that like? Yeah, you know, I think a like a workshop with actors, it's table read or whatever, is is often a luxury, frankly. I love doing it. Um, but to coordinate that kind of thing is tricky. And then are you promising these people these roles when this is recorded? And it, you know, when is this going to happen? Do I need to take this back to the woodshed for six months and work on it and everybody loses interest? So there's a lot of stuff to think about, I think, before you convene kind of your ideal group. Oh, I will say this, our Zoom world might open some doors in that respect, right? So a lot easier to get some folks together, sit down, maybe do a Zoom read. Um, I'd love to think about some stuff like that in the future. But yeah, I think if you can, Jack, yeah, please. And likewise, you know. I love, I love doing cold readings like that. So yeah, that's fine. Me too, yeah. me too. Um, but I, so I guess whether it's in a, re a space like that or it's in your first rehearsal when people read through, for sure I've had actors say, I don't get this, this doesn't work for me, this doesn't make sense. Um, and I usually tell them it's just bad writing, you know, so I got to work, <laughs> we got to work on it. Um, but I mean, that stuff, I think, you know, Steve, a lot of the stuff that you're saying is, is, is dead on and it comes down to like, who do you trust to give you this kind of feedback, right? There was a, one of the sessions earlier um, that, that uh, Jeff Adams was leading. They were talking about that kind of stuff, like, um, well, and gosh, the one just before us was talking about partnerships, you know, how to work with other people. And I think, um, so anyway, in the earlier session, they were talking about not everyone can read a script, right? And it's, it's not like some thing I'm, badge of honor I'm bragging about here. It's just that I think Jeff said a script is a blueprint. It's not a finished work. So you've got to hand that to someone who can read the blueprint. And not only is this not a film script, everyone's very familiar with film, you know, it's this, it's not a play script. This is something you would purely have to imagine in your mind. So all that a long way around of saying, I think when you do have that group of actors, that room full of actors, there is a, an audience who is serious about digging into this and wants to think about it and wants to know how it's going to be portrayed and what their character, what that role is. So I think that can be incredibly invaluable. Um, even if they just say, why do I, why does my character do this? This, you know, based on what we've read before, this doesn't feel right. You might go, okay, you know, there is a little disconnect there, but here's one, a single person embodying this single character. No one's ever done that before. And to them, something's wrong. That's a huge help and a huge red flag. It's funny that I was just thinking while you're talking about this, I prefer doing a table read than an actual acting role. <laughs> I prefer sitting and having that first draft so that I can, I can experience that 
help the the writer get a, get a, a handle on things and maybe help them with you know some some specific issues that are a problem i love that aspect so keep that in mind both of you that's i just didn't realize how much i enjoyed that david blue says in our in our chat i've spent years looking for useful feedback way too many people say i like it uh but any feedback i do receive uh, requires a grain of salt uh, i belong to two playwriting groups who meet weekly um, Jeff Billard says, I found it useful to ask some focus questions when I hand a script to a reader. I think that makes it easier and gives them permission to give feedback on when a reader has some parameters for their thoughts. I think that's a really good uh, comments. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, what do you think to those? Yeah, yeah, Jeff, that's excellent. I think to say, you know, well, I, I struggled with this. Did this come, how did this come across? Did you understand, you know, why they have to disassemble this computer at this point, any of that kind of stuff. And even if they go, eh, yeah, I, I get it. You might get a little sense that, okay, something may be a little bit wrong here. Steve, any comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it just falls into the category of trying to effectively communicate your vision for the story and creating a shared vision among all of the stakeholders involved in creating it. It's not just the writer, it's whoever's directing, it's whoever's doing the sound, if they're different people. It's, of course, the cast and trying to get everybody to kind of uh, unite together under some kind of shared understanding of what it is that you're trying to make. And it takes a while. I mean, every show has a particular tone or identity and it's something that's... Um, it takes a while to get everybody to have a common understanding of what it is that you're doing together. Um, but under the under the category of table reads, yeah, I've, I've done table reads throughout the whole first season. We started doing some already for the, the second and then the third season now. So uh, they're great. Uh, they're fantastic for me because the show is largely a comedy uh, just for seeing which jokes land because I can see, well, if the actors laugh, then I could pretty much guess the audience is going to laugh as well. But if nobody gets the joke, then I'm like, oh, all right, maybe I want to <laughs> tweak that a little bit. Or if it's clear that an actor isn't sure why he or she is saying something, that could be another red flag, as Bob said. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I would love to have more actors speak up in terms of like, hey, this doesn't make, more, make sense to me or what's going on here. Work with younger kids, they mostly don't have that much to offer. Um, and they're just trying to read through their lines, but you can at least tell when they're getting confused about something. Or uh, in terms of dialogue, if something's worded kind of funny and it's difficult for them to say, or it sounds funny coming out of their mouth, there's your opportunity to fix it. And sometimes I'll just, I'll, I'll keep the, uh, the printed version of the script with me and I'll just have a pen as we're going through the table read and I'll just bracket off a particular piece of dialogue saying reword this. And then I'll come back and figure out how to make it a little bit more conversational uh, next time around. So Fantastic. yeah, table reads can be great for that purpose. Um, and a couple more from Jeff there. I've written and worked on a number of original stage plays and it's common practice to, over, to workshop them and make changes based on what works during the reads. Yes, and Bob makes a great point, usually does, that it's difficult to get a group of people together and Zoom would be a great way to accomplish that. Count me in any time. That's wonderful. Right. I think Zoom right. is a super tool for that. I know that. Sorry, Jack. Sorry. No, go ahead. That, sorry, there's a Discord, uh, Podcast Addicts Discord, one specifically on audio fiction and audio drama, and they have one of the channels specifically table reads. So people can just drop in there and say, I'd like to do a table read. I don't know who would show up or whatever, but if you're looking for early um feedback that could be a way of doing it as well if you don't have friends maybe steve you need to have a table read with some adults that you trust and then bring it to the, to the kids afterwards that's a possibility i love the fact that you say the, the idea that they laugh at the right moments i found that for myself it's when they laugh at the wrong moments that you get really worried <laughs> that was a touching scene no i'm just kidding yeah. Um, I'd like to jump forward a little bit because uh, Steve brought up an interesting point when he said the word tone. So I, I want to know about, because he said shows have tones. So tone and mood and an author's style all come through 
often clearly during through the revisions, right? You, they solidify more. You can see the beginning of a tone and the mood. Um, mood is what the uh, readers feel from watching it. The a tone is what the authors try to place on a particular work. So there's a, a slight variation between the two. Do you have thoughts about how you try to utilize tone and mood in a show, Bob? Have you worked with that? And, and does, does it come off that your writing identifies a particular Robert Arnold style? Mm, I have no idea. Somebody else would have to tell me that, I think. <laughs> um, that, uh, Jeff, that makes me think of, uh, Jack, sorry, that makes me think of, of like, playing with bands and stuff where they go, well, who do we want to sound like? And you, well, that's really not up to you, right? You just play and you do your best and you're going to sound like you sound like. Um, but I do think, yeah, I think there is, I do think a lot of that comes in the revision. So this is a good time to be talking about that. Um, Steve, I think it sounds like you write, maybe you're, you're more experienced writing comedy than me. But for one example, like when I I'm writing comedy, sometimes the first couple of drafts are more about the plot. And then in the revisions, you start to find the jokes. Okay, there are these little moments, you know, here's the beat that the joke can come in. Um, and, and that kind of stuff isn't always obvious right off the bat, I don't think. Um, tone, mood, all that stuff, that's more subtle, right? That's not just the plot, that's not the engine, that's something, uh, that's the way that those things are told that's the way your different characters speak so certainly when i go back and revise you know you think okay well everybody kind of sounds the same right now but they're very different characters so i need to think about how each of them is speaking and and tweak some of that as i revise to make it clear this is you know this character comes from this background this one's very very different um and they they're you know then that can be a source of conflict that can be a source of tone comedy all that kind of stuff so, yeah, you know, it's not quite that one, like quite that streamlined, but often for me, an early draft is more about how do we get from point A to point B. And then I think I kind of started off talking about this. Then you sort of go in and, and find those character moments and those ways to, to, to almost sneak that in um, as an organic part of your, of your ongoing plot. Interesting. Bob, do you try to put comedy in every show to mm. kind of leaven the bread, so to speak, if it's a kind of a depressing story? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, I, you know, do I try to not always? I mean, I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but this may get, us off, get me off on a tangent, but Steve, what I would say is like, I as, a, I as a listener, I as a reader, I as a viewer, I don't believe something that has no humor in it. I, it doesn't ring true to me, right? Because that's just not how I, how I experience the world. So if I'm watching some really heavy drama and no one ever in the midst of the worst part of it, nobody ever cracks some sarcastic joke it's not that it's too heavy for me. It's just that I don't believe it anymore because that's what we do as humans, right? We do try to leaven the bread, um, even if the joke doesn't work. So, you know, I like, uh, and that, I think that's, there are some directors or some writers who I just get tired of because everything's so serious and so heavy all the time. And, you know, it just becomes like a one note kind of thing. So. To me, humor is human. And so I think it does sort of sneak into my, into a lot of my work, even the heavier stuff. What I discovered most recently myself is that when you see a conflict in, in tone and mood, you often see dark comedy. You'll see this, mm -hmm. this expectation and then the, the audience sees it in an entirely different way than what they, they were expecting it to be. And it's those conflicts of tone and mood that can provide this sort of almost quirkiness that doesn't quite fit and feels off and causes a sense of humor. Not always, but it's certainly it's there, I've noticed in, in many kinds of writing. And I, I think it's a really valuable trick. So do you, we talk about, Steve was saying, you know, each show has its own tone 
is that self built in or do you find that grows organically steve in the stuff that you write because i think of and just before you answer i think if it grows organically because i'm giving you an extra second to think about it you know i think if it grows organically it says something more about the author that it's internally uh expressed externally internally expressed to the external but if it's something that you formulate more it it could be more constructed that way mechanically what do you think um as with all things i i think that you have to do what's best for the story but in order to do that you have to understand what the story is <laughs> and it's so interesting with writing it's uh, sure it's creating something, but uh, it's almost a process of discovering something as you're creating it. Like at the very beginning, you don't even know what story you're even trying to tell. You just have some loose ideas that sort of seem related to each other and you keep picking at it and picking at it. And uh, at a certain point of a seed for a story emerges and then it tends to grow just like anything natural. It starts out as a small seed and tends to to grow and develop from there the more you work at it and uh you know you pair away things that seem like they're not the story or maybe in a different story and you stick with what is but um i think along that process a, a, a distinct tone or an identity emerges like i said earlier like it wasn't until the end of the first season of of the show that i'm writing where i really felt like i really understood what <laughs> what the show was uh, you know, for 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 example, uh, sure, it's a show about a bunch of spy kids going on adventures or whatever, but it's also a show that's self-aware. So it's a podcast that is aware of itself as a podcast. So at a certain point, at certain points, you'll have the characters kind of make reference to complaining about how little downloads we're getting and then jump <laughs> back into a character as the character they're playing and continue on. I, I don't recall specifically when I made the decision that we were going to have a self-aware uh, comedy spy show that is a show about spy kids making a podcast about a show about spy kids, but it somehow works. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I can't say it's not, it's cer certainly not like the first thing I didn't do is sit down and say, Oh, I want to make a self-aware spy show. That that decision came much, much later, maybe a year later, as I was tinkering around with different outlines and drafts and so forth. And at a certain point, it kind of just kind of emerged like that. I don't know. It, like, it, it's mysterious. It's it, it's it's not as if you have all the ideas up in your head and you're just writing them down. Somehow you just discover things and you're, whoa. You see a possibility that you didn't see the day before. I don't know how that happens. Bob Robert E. Howard often said that he never created Conan the Barbarian in the world that it came from. He just saw it and and was reporting it as it was. These what Steve is describing, I've described as well as kind of a mystical attach attachment to the story, where I find that I'm as much a, a caught in the grip of the story as anybody else. Um, are, do you find that's the situation as well through either the first draft or the revisions too? Yes, when things are going well, yes, right? So what's really lovely, and when you can tell you're later in your revision process is when you start reading at the beginning and you get caught up in the story again, right? Mm -hmm. Which can be dangerous because sometimes you wanna read for more technical things or you wanna watch for details and things like that. But I think, um, it's almost like, I'm gonna make a strained analogy here, you guys bear with me, but I remember reading a sommelier or somebody talking about wine and they said, when you have a balanced wine, it, it has a spherical quality in your mouth. There's nothing spiky about it. One thing doesn't stick way out and hit your palate funny or three things or whatever. And I think the revision process maybe is, is sort of uh, the process of shaving down to that sphere so that when I'm reading this story, I don't go, you know, when I'm reading my own script, I don't stop and go, this dialogue sounds so fake, or this is such a slog, or the details of this world don't make sense. The smoother it becomes, and the more you polish it, the smoother it becomes, the easier it is to get into the flow of the story and get caught up in the story. So... Yeah, I think that's a 
maybe that's all it is. Um, I remember. Oh, he froze a bit for us. I hope we haven't lost him. Are we throw is are you still with us, Steve? I'm still with you. Yeah, that's he, good. He's frozen for me. He too. is frozen. So this uh, is the nature of of the Zoom conversations. Uh, however, we can continue and, and see if we can get him back. Uh, I think at this point he's probably dropped out. Um, Might but drop out and rejoin. Yeah, we'll get him to rejoin. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> The point being specifically that um, this has to be a bit of an organic process and it takes time. You've mentioned this before, Steve, for those who hadn't heard it, that yeah, he's gone and he'll be back. It does take a lot of time to be able to get the story in a situation where, like you said before, and I know you're quoting someone else, story isn't finished, it's abandoned. There's Bob yeah. back. Welcome back, Bob. <laughs> I think my internet got oh and it's gone again <laughs> yeah oh there you are oh glitchy yeah it's a little glitchy sorry guys that's fine that's fine do you want to uh, try to I, i'm not sure where you got lost left off lost off there from yeah yeah I, I i think i was saying i remember reading a musician talking about the process of practice is really just the process of finding and fixing mistakes that's all it is and that's in a way that's all revision is, right? Right, right. It's funny. I was just thinking when you were talking about this, uh, you did a number of years of Halloween sp specials. We do transcontinental terror and Steve has done um, um, 11th, hour. 11th hour. I was going to say ninth for some reason. My numbers. I'm, I'm an English teacher, not a math teacher. Yeah. 11th hour productions. And um, you, uh, you said to me, you said, tell people about this. And then you said, why don't you write something, which had never occurred to me. And then I wrote to you, Tulpa, which took me 20 minutes, which I was shocked that it took me that long because it was just it just came right out. It was like one of those moments where it didn't take a lot of revisions. And boy, did you guys knock it out of the park. That was just so powerful the way you did it. It's one of my favorite uh, productions of of my shows and I wanted to thank you that personally I'm sorry for taking the time for that but it, it just it made me it reminded me of that it was such a fun thing thank you that's a, it was a pleasure and Jack that was one of those wonderful things where you put it out into the world I said hey Jack Ward write us a horror story and you came back with this gorgeous heartbreaking poignant supernatural tale that just I mean it was just it was just beautiful. So I, oh. I, I loved it. Thank you. I wanted to write something different than what everybody else would be doing, like the blood and guts horror story. I wanted to go almost like with a ghost story, you know, those typical loves ghost stories, just to try something different. So that was Did great. Did you ever? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now we're getting down to, I guess we can talk. It's like you said, I think Bob's right. It's hard. I have difficulties. So I don't know what my style is. I don't, I know that I try to be able to um, take the best I can from various different people. And so it's hard to talk about style in that way. And I leave it to other people to say what a Jack Ward story is and what a Jack Ward story isn't. But I think it is important for us to be able to identify what are some of the best practices that we can have on the writing side of things. If we're gonna create a best practices guide for people, what would that include? A lot to think about, isn't it? So I'm gonna. It's a huge thing, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you think about it for a second. Can I share something with you guys? Like I'm gonna show my share screen, and let you let you see a little bit of my mechanical process. So I'll hit. I we haven't done this before, but we'll we'll give it a shot. I'm gonna share a screen with um here. So can you guys see that? Yes. So this is this is a database that I've created, and in it is every story idea that I would like to do that I haven't done. And so some of these are huge. Like these this is my Wavefront anthology, and anytime I get a story idea, I I write it down with with notes and the whole bit specifically to talk about it. And I will attach a script to that, and I will put it through its paces. So let's take um. A deadline show um and i can there's one called decision 
I, if you notice, I actually have a series of, of um, set, uh, statuses for it. So I can mark it as ready for editing. I can set it as a proof. Huh. Eventually I, can, I, I will mark it for actors. Um, and then I, I ha also have a production mark and uh, a release mark. So um, I have a thing called progress and you can see that here I have all of these and where they're progress, right? Have they been signed off? Is the product released? Where they're at? Some of them are closed. Some of them are works in progress. Some of them are still in the editing situation. So there's a bunch of different varieties. And I built that as a way to be able to, sorry, I'm gonna shut off my, stop my share now. I built that as a way for me to follow through a series of stages in a script. So I said, like, where do I want this script to go along the whole life, lifespan of an actual production cycle, right? So we're only dealing with the writing side of things right now, but I do have it where I'll have like two different editing uh, statuses. Has it been edited twice beyond me? When I've done my rough edits, who else have I sent it to that two different people have had a chance to see it before I can mark that complete and start moving along to cast, to uh, record, to post-production, to sign off from all that kind of thing. And um, it saved me a whole lot because I do have tons of ideas. As you can see, there's over 150 things there that I haven't worked on. Um, so I'm never running out of ideas uh, but I, I don't want to lose them either. Do you have a way that in your own sort of best practices, a place of collecting all this information as you guys, as I have done as well? Steve's nodding. What yeah. Um, well, ideas hit you when you're least expecting them. So it's important if you're a writer to always have some way to track that wherever you are. Could be just carrying a notebook around with you or some index cards or a napkin or anything. It doesn't really matter as long as you can record the idea in a way that you'll recognize it later. So I've made that mistake. <laughs> I look at an old note and I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so it, it has to be clear enough that it's going to trigger the initial inspiration, hopefully. Um, but I use a, a software called Scrivener to do most of my planning. And that's just a way to basically, it allows you to open up a bunch of different Word docs or RTF files all at the same time. And you can easily flip back and forth between one and the other. <clears throat> and I have uh, just a junkyard of various various ideas and various stages of development. Some things are just you know one or two sentences of just a vague idea. Uh, some are more developed, some are fully developed, some are scripted. And it, it's funny, it, it doesn't necessarily go in the order that you receive them in. <laughs> some ideas get pushed to the front of the line because you suddenly have a whole lot of ideas like that one story you were talking about, Jack, and where it's almost complete. And so, oh, well, all right, I guess we're doing that one next. <laughs> and then something else, maybe, you know, 10, 15 years old and still hasn't been completed. And I don't know if some of them, maybe some of them never will, but. No, it's uh, it's just so mysterious how the mind works and how the creative process works. I, in some ways, I think of it sort of like a, uh, maybe like a honeybee or something, like just working on different parts of the hive. And it's not necessarily like start at the top and go to the bottom or start from the left and go to the right. It's a little bit here and a little bit there until it gradually evolves. At least that's how it's been with me. I highly recommend Scrivener. I use it for my prose stuff for that reason. It's really great to be able to, and, and super to be able to print off in various different formats as well. So that's great. Yeah. Bob, what do you do? How do you put your stuff together? Boy, nothing like that, Jack. That's really impressive. <laughs> that is so impressive. I, <laughs> you mean you mean people don't just try to remember their ideas until? <laughs> I have a terrible memory. That's why I do all this. It's the only way I can remember this stuff. <laughs> um, I I do, and I, um, Steve. Earlier, you were showing you had a you had a page of, of an outline of something you were working on too. That, yeah. You know that. I'm, I'm, I am uh, impressed by that level of, of detail and planning and, you know, all that stuff. I will have some stray Google Docs where I will, you know, 
drop some ideas, put maybe put them in a folder. Oh yeah, this was that story about that cult or whatever it is, you know, um, or I come up with something that feels like a joke and I put it in the folder of the show that seems like it should go in. Um, but I, you know, I, I love that. And, and I love the idea too, by the way, that you can put all that stuff down, you can keep it, but yeah, you don't have to, not everything is gonna be a winner, right? You don't have to go in order. You don't have to see everything through. You take the most fruitful things. You take the pieces, you might put them together into something new. Um, but just to have the pieces in a database like that is how, how wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, like I said, it's the only way I can, I can keep remembering these things. Here's something I want to ask you guys. It's a little uh, tangential, but I find it really helpful for me. And maybe it's a good trick. I will retell a story that I love over and over to different people because the more I tell it, the more detailed it gets. Do you find that happens? <clears throat> How do you tell them? So two nights ago, I had this idea, okay? So, and it, it <clears throat> came from me because um, I, I was remembering that an old girlfriend of mine was talking about a city that she constantly dreamed about. And then anytime she started talking and she knew everywhere this city was, all these different elements, all the different segments in the city and the area. And then I started dreaming about a city. And so then she stopped dreaming about it because she was talking about it. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if there was this weird kind of city in the dream realm that suddenly was taking the energy off of people. And it was like a mind virus that people would talk to the other person about it. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, what if they die and their, their souls are stuck in this city? And because the city is, I'm always dreaming about, is just filled with people who are doing their things and they don't even know that they're dead. But that energy is being used by some malevolent demon which wants to be able to, and then I'm like, oh yes, and this is what happens. This malevolent demon wants to take this city and bring it into our reality. And I remembered a couple of years ago, there was this whole thing about a Chinese, in a Chinese city, you could look up and see in the clouds this mirage of a city coming in. And I thought of what if that wasn't a mirage? What if this was the dream realm city coming down and taking over the reality of this city because this demon was just pushing through and all that. And I'm like, that's an amazing story. That would be so much fun. How many episodes is that? But the thing is, I had to tell that story to two or three different people before the next segment would come out because I would be stopped. I'm like, yeah, but how do they win? How do they defeat this demon? Oh, that's how. And then I would start talking that out and the person would go, yeah, I can see that. Or you could see them sort of like hesitate, not knowing what to say. So I often talk out things that I haven't fully worked out, but I, that are really brimming on the tip of my tongue. Do you find either one of you doing that? Uh, similar. Uh where uh, I, I talk over uh, some ideas I have for episodes with my collaborator, collaborators, uh, Austin Beach and, and Dane Leonardson, especially if I'm getting stuck. And uh, like, guys, all right, I have this idea. It's pretty cool. We're going to go here. We're going to try to do this. But it doesn't really, like, I'd like to end up here at this volcano, but I'm not really sure how to get to A to B and and uh, a lot of times they'll come up with really, really good ideas. Um, I think composer Dane Lennonson, even though he's mostly doing the, uh, the the music for the show and the uh, the final mix and mastering, he comes up with a lot of great story ideas. So that's one thing that um, I don't necessarily think it all has to be on the writer to come up with the stories. I think stories can come from story ideas anyway can come from anybody, and uh, they can be good ideas. It's it, it takes the, the craft really comes in as far as taking those great ideas and turning them into a coherent narrative. That's, that's the, a lot of the writing craft, but I mean, I, I tend to think of every person who's collaborating on a project as being a writer in the early stages. So here's, here's my only difference that I don't, I'm not eliciting uh, fixes from them because they're not generally writers. They're just people who are like listening to me talk about stories. Yeah. So it's in, in the talking 
that I'm working out the story in front of them, they don't even, they, they, they might, I can see the reaction to the story, but they won't give me a fix. So it's kind of left to me. <laughs> Have you found that ever happened, Bob? Do you do that with your wife? No, I really don't. I, I, I have those conversations with myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, gonna, I'm driving to work and I'm like, okay, but then what if they, the building's on fire when they get there? Well, how would they get out of, you know? Yes. Um, and I think, Jack, that probably goes back to what I was talking about earlier, that I, I have a tendency to keep that stuff close to my chest until I feel like it's ready to share. Right. Um, but I, I mean, I love the idea. You would, again, this, this whole previous panel was talking about collaboration. I love the idea that you know, you guys are in, you're like these, uh, I don't know, some early 20th century writers sitting around in a cafe, just like coming up with ideas. And well, what if the city is, is actually real and then it can come down, you know, um, yeah. how fun and how, how great to have people who will listen to you do that kind of stuff. I don't know if anyone in my real life would put up with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm lucky I have parents that way that live nearby. So and they, and they love story too. So I get to throw it at them. And maybe they're just being kind when I go through it, but it helps work through. And like you, and I'm sure like Steve, I'm working a lot of this out in my head, often in drives back and forth and commutes for those reasons as well. So anything else that you think should be put up in the best practices guide? I know we're into the question and answer section and uh, I know David Blue just left and thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry that you had to leave. It was great having you here. Um, but um, if you have questions, throw them in the Q&A box as we do it. But while we're, while we're waiting, more um, best practices for writers. What would you expect? What would you suggest? What makes good writing that people should do good habits? <clears throat> well, we, we talked a little bit about soliciting feedback and, and getting feedback and being open to it and stuff. And I think that becomes a skill in itself that writers have to develop, right? And what I mean by that is you have to, you have to ask for feedback, you have to mean it. You can't be one of those writers, Jack, that you were describing earlier, who just wants the praise, right? Um, but then I think if, if you can learn to be more objective about it, I think then you can also learn to take what's useful and just graciously leave the rest behind. Right. So I'm never going to argue with somebody about why they're wrong about my script. Uh, you know, I'm going to say that. Thank you. That is really interesting. Did you, you know, I might ask a few questions. And then if it, if that suggestion or whatever I'm hearing from them, if that just doesn't work for me, then I'm, I'm cool just leaving that. Right. I don't need to convince you that you're, that you're wrong about that. Um, in the best scenarios, you know, you hear something and it just resonates with you. And you think, oh, thank you. Yes, you have given me a gift. I'm going to use that. Um, but there's, I, I, I think I'm trying to say there's some, there's both sides to this, where if you're too close to it and it's personal to you, yeah, you don't hear the good stuff, but you also can't sift out the useful stuff from the not useful stuff. So there's an objectivity and a, a, a yeah, there's just sort of a, a remove, I think, that you have to develop do you guys find that yeah sure steve um yeah i mean there's a certain certain maturity and groundedness that you need to have in order to be really a good writer um they're, they're, writing isn't even one thing it's more of an aggregation of skills that all fall under the label of writing but there's many different subcomponents in there that people are at varying levels in terms of how good or how not good they are with it could be anything maybe you're great at coming up with ideas and they're spectacular ideas but you don't necessarily know what to do with them or maybe you're you're much better at coming up with characters than you are with uh, negotiating a plot or figuring out how to make a satisfying arc to a particular episode or a season or a show or um <clears throat> so there's uh there's strengths and weaknesses all around with, with different types of writers uh, but I think one of the aspects that's, uh, I don't know if this is necessarily a best practice, but uh, there's, a, there's a, a requisite character you need in order to be a good writer as well. And you need to have a lot of patience. You need to have a very low time preference. If you're expecting immediate gratification or immediate reward for anything that you do, uh, 
you're going to be waiting a while. So like, I did, unfortunately being the writer, it's like, I'm the first person to see a vision of what the story could be. And the last person to hear it is different than a sound designer who's hearing it after it's already been written, after it's already been recorded, after the lines have already been edited, after, you know, the sound design, everything has mostly been put in there and they're like, the, they're putting the icing on the cake, so to speak. So maybe, you know, wait a couple of weeks or a month or so before the episode is actually finalized and released, but I'm waiting more than a year, year and a half. Sometimes the episode comes out, by the time it comes out, I forget I even wrote the damn thing. So I mean, if you're expecting to get like immediate praise or something, <laughs> woo, don't be the writer because you got the longest wait. <laughs> and, uh, you, you have to please yourself. I mean, you have to enjoy what you wrote because you're the first audience. And uh, you know, it, it, it's so difficult to try to write something that you don't enjoy yourself. You know, so it's, it, it, it it takes it takes a certain kind of character and quite honestly not everybody not everybody has it or has developed those aspects of their character to the extent that they need to in order to um to do uh, the writing role which is you know it's not necessarily a knock on them i mean they, there might be something they'd be better suited to acting maybe or something uh, but uh <sighs> You got to be partially insane to, to want to do this kind of thing because there's so much work and there's so little reward for it, at least that comes immediately. It's just, yeah. I've often told people, um, if you can, don't write. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's What's the writing worst. Advice? Don't do it. Richard, Richard Bach, I know, and I have people sitting there saying, you know, please tell me, you know, people will be on social media and say, please, you know, lift me up so I can write because I don't feel like I can do it. And I'm like, good, stop because i can't help it i i i really feel like richard bach who said famous for you know john loons and seagull and illusions and all that kind of stuff and he said i um i am gripped by a monster that holds me down by the throat and says i will not let you go until you write me and i i i get possessed by ideas and, and until i at least put them down to a little bit or something like that I can't think of anything else. And it's it's really a, as much of a bane to my existence as anything else. I love writing, but um, if if it was one of those things that I didn't have just this, this constant co compel compelling nature to it, it would make my life a whole lot easier. <laughs> and that I could enjoy things more often for that reason. So I must write. And when I don't, I'm un, I'm a, that's when I'm a miserable human being. Is when I'm unable to write. Did you guys find the same thing? Yes, I love that. I love that. And there's a, there's another author, uh, Jack, who says that a little less eloquently, and I can't remember who it is. Um, I, Dorothy Parker or somebody who said, "I I hate writing, but I love having written." <laughs> so it's like it's painful to do it and get it out, but once it's done, you love it and you feel good about it. Um, but I love that sentiment, and I think especially especially for a group like this that we're talking to today, all these folks we've heard from, you know, few if any of us are doing this as a job. Right. Few if any of us get anything out of this other than satisfaction. And so, yeah, you're talking, you are talking to an audience of people who can't just let this go, right? Because we have every reason in the world to just go do something else, right? Cook dinner, watch TV, read a book. Those are all great ways to spend your time. But here we are because we cannot help it. And I, you know, it is a, it, it, I, I get the demon or the monster holding you by the throat thing, but also then when you connect to other people who have that, what a, what a wonderful thing and, and what a great connection to have. Oh, it makes all the difference in the world to know you're not alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, so here's the next question. When do you abandon something? When do you write something and you're like, this is just not working. I have to throw it away either start again or move to another project i don't know that anything is ever permanently abandoned it just isn't working in the moment and so i have a big junkyard folder of various things that i tried to make work out for whatever reason at the time i couldn't and that could be a scene that just wasn't working. It could have been an episode idea, several episode ideas. I kind of half developed and I got to a certain point. I just didn't. It's, it's, uh, 
<clears throat> it's kind of like the who's that guy sisyphus i think who's pushing the rock up the hill if you start getting that feeling where you're just pushing and pushing and pushing and nothing is going your way then maybe that's just a story that doesn't need to happen right now and um, maybe it just needs to to percolate for a while it's very interesting how the passage of time causes a difference of perception for something that you wrote that's something you were white hot excited about six months ago now you look at it and you're like meh that kind of sucks actually <laughs> what was i so excited about uh, or it could be an old idea that you could just couldn't figure out where it was going maybe there's three of those and like oh this one didn't work this one didn't work this one didn't work but you know if i kind of combine them together now each one on their own wasn't very interesting but the combination of the three is pretty interesting so <laughs> it's just uh yeah, I, I never permanently throw away anything. I just kind of sideline it for a, an indefinite period of time. That's right. I love how Jeff put up with, there's so many quotes upon this. Uh, Mark Twain, writing is easy. All I have to do is cross out the wrong words. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's another one who says, I forget, maybe Jeff can, or Lothar can look this up. It's like, writing is easy. All you have to do is open up a vein and bleed on the page, right? <laughs> and so that's right. What was the other one? There's somebody there. Oh God, there was a writer famous for not having written much and said I only wrote. How did writing today go, George or whoever? Great, I, I got seven words written. All right, seven words. The problem is I don't know what order they go in. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, have you abandoned anything? Is there is there a, a lost toy, a lost island of few, broken <laughs> misfit toys of Bob Arnold's work somewhere? You better believe it, and and with good reason too. Um, so, Steve, I love what you said. Though it's true, it's never it's never deleted, right? Why why get rid of that stuff? Um, and it's the same thing if you write songs or anything like that. You might try to write something, and you and then you listen to it later and think that sucked. But there's a line in there that was good. There's a hook. There's a something, a riff, something that I can then use somewhere else. Um, so I, again, I, you know, some of this goes back to, it's this weird balance of like, if you are writing stuff and putting it out into the world, there has to be some ego involved in it, right? Because you think, well, I have something that's worth saying, but you have to then be able to look at it objectively and go, okay, this is not working. This is not worth saying. And I guess the time to do that is before you start recording it for sure, right? Before you put a lot of time into it. Um, and start and start kind of investing in something because Steve's right this stuff can take year year and a half two years and if you get yourself in a project that you don't feel strongly about how are you going to get through that how's that ever going to come out right well I, I, I'm, I got my answer Paul Gallico wrote that in Confessions of a Story Writer and then Red Smith from Jeff Billet that was Lothar and Je uh, Jeff said writing is easy just open a vein and bleed and then Hemingway with the famous one, there's nothing to writing. All you do is sit down in a typewriter and bleed. So <laughs> there's a lot of bleeding involved. There's a lot of lacerations and, <laughs> and such when it comes to writing, which makes me ask this next question of all the various different lacerations. When you're writing scripts, do you break, do, do you save them as different versions every time you do an updated version? You keep it as the same file. How do you what was your best practices for naming conventions for when you get a, a proofread version to the next version to the next version? Do you have a naming convention that you operate from? Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Good, good uh, process question there, Jack. And yes, I learned years ago, every time I sit down and I'm doing substantial work, copy, paste, new file, change the date. So episode title, number, and then I have the date afterward. Um, and it's less about keeping stuff, although that helps everything you've tried. You know, if you delete something, not a huge deal, it's still back there. But it's more that I had a, I had a few experiences where the file just got corrupted and I only had one and it was gone. So there is no point in, <laughs> in risking that, right? Oh, There's no point. So I heard yeah, I will. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so now I do a new file and then when I'm done, I upload it to Dropbox or something as well to have two copies of it. So for sure. What about you, Steve? What what do you do to keep your versions straight? 
I don't necessarily use the function that I could use in Final Draft where it allows you to color code successive drafts and whatnot. But I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about my process. By the time I get to the draft, I've already thought through the thing so many times that not a whole lot changes, although something always changes. Um, it never quite goes how I think it's going to go in the outline, no matter how detailed that outline is. Um, but I do find it useful to let something cool off for a while and then go back and look at it again a few weeks later, a month later, just because the emotional attachment to something you just made is it's similar to giving birth, I would imagine. Not that I have any experience with that, but uh, you, it's your little baby and it's cute and you love it and whatever, but uh, it's hard to be objective about something you just gave birth to. So if you set it aside for a while, you can kind of look at the baby as being a little bit yeah, I guess it wasn't quite as cute as I thought it was a few months. They all looked like Winston Churchill. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and then it, the more time that goes by, like so I could look at something I wrote two years ago as if somebody else wrote it, like, oh, this is crap. Yeah, let me fix this, change that. So I even disagree with myself after a period of time, <laughs> which I would hope I do. Hopefully that means I'm getting better. And not just, you know, changing my mind. I see things that are flaws that I didn't see as a flaw a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. I highly recommend a software called Carbonite. Does anyone else use that? Mm -hmm. Carbonite. It, so this came, this came to me by, from John Bell too late. I lost everything in my hard drive. And usually I, I back stuff up a lot, but I ended up <coughs> using... Um, I had been taking, making script books from all the scripts that I had done. I had lost them all. So I think I was working on seven different script books and that was a year and a half worth of stuff that I don't, didn't update because I normally update through Lotus Notes, my scripts and the books, the pros, I wasn't using that. So Carbonite, for those people who don't know, you pay a small fee every month and every file you change in your documents, whatever fo folders you want, automatically uploads to its own uh, Carbonite spot. So it constantly keeps updating and uploading. So it's having a, a direct file in, in the cloud that you can use with Carbonite. And it just, it knows the differences, the variations that you've done in the whole bit. So I've deleted a file and I went, well, I'll just pull it down from Carbonite. And I get it that uh, like 30 seconds later. So there are, it's, it's now saved me. I wish I'd known about it a year or two before. John Bell, but thank you. I, I, he finally told me about it. I, I highly recommend um, because losing stuff is the most maddening thing in the world and we've all gone through it and it's just it's almost rage inducing just the thought of lo all the work that you lose in that respect so oh, yeah. <laughs> i we have no questions and i think we've kind of hit most of my my main things i want to wrap up the day by talking a little bit um some of you were here i think bob was here for the whole thing pretty much weren't you bob so a good, a good chunk of it i enjoyed it i i think that uh for those people who didn't see all of it or didn't experience all of it i'll just run through what we did and um we we started our call course with welcoming and opening a discussion that i had with jeff and lothar and david alt then we we continued with lothar leading us a, a discussion on how to approach your project so what you wanted it to do, like how you wanted to have your project um, take shape and form and what kind of style and format and what ways you wanted to be able to do and talked about specifically things like what kind of limitations are going to be involved in that. And those limitations got extended when we took take a look at the story structure. And so I led that that um, where we would talk about um, how is it different? Um, the story structure in an audio drama form. Uh, how does perspective work? Um, what kind of, um, uh, does, do you wanna have a single show or do you wanna have a bunch of episodes? We talked about those elements. Then we had um, Jeff come in, Jeffrey Adams come in and talk about more specifics about uh, how you should use, what kind of script software you should use, what kind of format would you use? Are you uh, engaging in things like meta stories or Easter eggs and 
tropes and how do you utilize your uh, team to be able to help with the writing process. And then afterwards, uh, around, just before this now, we uh, had Jeffrey Billard come in and talk about teamwork and team writing and how that adds into the mix and whether or not you can create more effective stories by having a group of people around as opposed to uh, just writing all by yourself in um, ab absentia of everything else. And then we finished off, of course, with, with the guests here today talking about revisions, best practices, and ways to be able to produce your audio drama. If I could ask you guys both to give me the best advice that you could give somebody who's thinking about writing an audio drama, other than my advice is stop if you can. No, not for audio drama, never. Just writing, period. If you could come up with a good piece of advice or pieces of advice, what would you tell them? Let's start with you, Bob. I was hoping you'd start with Steve. Um, well, <laughs> you got to pick on people at different times here. So, <laughs> so I guess two things come to mind, Jack. One, I'll, I'll reiterate what I said in an earlier panel. Do something and get it finished. Just do it, right? And, and I, the second thing is, is similar to that. There's a, I think it's a Louis Armstrong quote where he says, you know, learn your scales, learn your rhythms, learn all you can, and then you forget all that shit and you just play, right? So you, you, you learn this stuff by doing, and you learn this stuff by doing it wrong and by then just thinking about what's wrong. So I think, I think um, we're having these great conversations today. All this is from the far end of the experience, right? So uh, anyone who's wanting to get started, just get started. You can hear people say stuff, but there's some things you're not gonna, you're not gonna understand until you just do it and get it done and do the next one. Excellent. Steve. Um, <clears throat> I think yeah, what Bob just said about <clears throat> uh, the the Louis Armstrong quote, I think is super important. Particularly for some reason with young writers, they are, they tend to want to buck the idea of uh, learning the craft, and they want to be original by just oh, I don't want to learn. I don't want to be constrained by structure. I don't want to be constrained by convention. I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to be original, and most of the time they end up just writing crap thinking that it's original, not realizing that every other 23 year old in the world does the same exact thing, thinking they're being original. Um, but through acquainting yourself with the craft, through listening to as much audio drama as possible, good and bad, and also uh, identifying why it's good or why an aspect of it was good or why an aspect of it was bad, if you could at least recognize that for yourself, that tends to lead to your own list of internal best practices where well i have this worked or that worked or this didn't work or this that didn't work even if you don't communicate that to the creator necessarily it can help inform your own practice but at the same time as bob also said you learn by doing so i think it's a combination of <clears throat> making your own mistakes and learning from the mistakes of others making your own victories and also learning from the victory of of, of others but um I, I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of hope for the art form itself. I, I feel like audio drama as an art form has nowhere close to reached its potential, uh, particularly in the United States. When uh, you know I'm not a super fan of the old time radio genre, partially because they were just cranking them out at such a frenetic pace that I don't think you could make the equivalent of great. American literature in audio when you only have a week or a few days to write a story and produce it and, and chuck it out live on a Saturday night from a New York studio. Um, <clears throat> I'm waiting for the the audio equivalent of the great American novel. And, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to get there. Um, even, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some credit, Bob. I know we haven't talked before today i don't believe but i mean i did listen to chatterbox back in 2009 2010 and that was one of the earlier 
groups that I first got inspired by. It was a, I still remember a story called The Dead Girl that you did. And uh, you did a kind of a dark version of Pinocchio that I found fascinating. And there was a certain literary component to the storytelling that was very attractive for me and got me inspired about doing it myself. Um, and that's what it is. <laughs> you know, you just trying to, trying to achieve something that hasn't been done before. And then people get inspired by that and they want to try to equal or top what you did. And, and then hopefully, you know, it's, it's just a different medium. It's a different type of technology. Maybe uh, we're at a point in time where the novel itself is maybe waning among the general public, but this is an art form that I think still has a long way to go in terms of really making great, compelling art that uh, people can enjoy. So, Excellent. yeah, Steve, thank that you. Makes me so, so happy to hear you say that about those old shows. And, and I can't even tell you like, well, first I will tell the, the author um, that was one of my one of my good collaborators who wrote both of those you named. But it, when we were doing those, I mean, we were still hanging blankets on the wall and, you know, trying to figure out how to plug mics in. And so, I mean, those were, couple, especially the Dead Girl, early, early shows. So yeah. I love hearing that that made, made a difference. Um, and now I want to hear the, I want to hear the Jack Ward answer to that question. Oh, okay. What was the question? <laughs> no, I, it's getting late at night. No, a, a, a advice you were saying, or I was saying, right? Is that it? So the best things you can do? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, I, I love what you guys said, and I was going to end off at what Steve said, but since you asked, um, don't try to do what's popular. Don't try to make yourself the greatest podcast that's ever been. Tell your story. Tell your story well. And, 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 and write for you, write for fun, write to enjoy, write to improve and write to collaborate, write to find more people. I started the Sonic Society because I wasn't, I, I always listened to audio drama, but I wanted to find other like-minded people that I could listen to and grow from as well. So it was, wasn't was always just altruistic. It was, I knew that I wanted to learn the craft better myself and grow. And I agree with Steve that you need to take the time to do that. And my, my brothers that are that are there are gonna, are gonna do, uh chomping at the bit because i always say start with a format like like i it th was brought up that i enjoy the hero's journey i'm not saying you always have to use the hero's journey but as a teacher i teach three paragraph uh persuasive essay style does everybody use three paragraph as persuasive essay style basically nobody does but you learn the form so you can get rid of it but you have to learn the form first you have to be able to build a bookshelf the way everybody builds a bookshelf, then you can get creative. So you learn the craft, you learn how to put story together, and then you can break all the rules and do all the fun stuff that happens because that's how it will work. That's how I see it. And I, and I hope that there's more out there. I joked about the idea of not, st of, of not writing if you can help it, but I'm always craving new story. And I know everybody, all of us love to hear a good news story. That's also one of the reasons why we're in it. Steve's absolutely right. Listen to audio drama all the time. Bob, you mentioned old time radio that has inspired you. It's inspired me as well that got us going. These things are part of the, 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 the grist that helps you and makes you a better writer in every way, shape or form. Take in story wherever you can and send it out to the world. It can only be a better place because of it. Is that, is that a good answer? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that's all we have time for this evening. And for the first day of MadCon Virtual, be sure to join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. And I want to thank my panel members here. I want to thank Bob Arnold from Spoken Signal, Knee uh, Chatterbox Audio. <laughs> and I want to thank Steve Schneider from Wordtastic. Kid, is it Kid Detectives? Uh, kid agents is the, kid agents. Uh, 
because it was just fantastic before and now it's it's you've added the kid agents so we've added the subtitle because uh people are thinking that it's some kind of esl teaching podcast and oh okay. no it's a story no it's a fun story too by the way <laughs> bob, bob absolutely have a chance to listen to it i know you guys would really enjoy each other's work as i do and i really appreciate it Thank you everyone for listening and being here. I can't wait to see you till tomorrow. I mean, when we when tomorrow we start talking about acting and recording, whole new slate of, of panelists. It's gonna be so much fun. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night.